we're uh, we're now <coughs> moving more into uh, uh, I guess our system analysis. Um, we're going to look at what's called moving boundary work. This is the work done by a system with actual displacement of the boundary or work done on the system uh, by that as well. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that goes on in your uh, automobile engine. Moving boundary work is precisely what's going on in the piston cylinders as the pistons move in and out. Uh, it's also, of course, what goes on with compressors and other type things. So, uh, we're going to take a, a little bit to look at that. First, a bit of a review. If you remember from Physics 1, if you Physics 1 professor was half-assed, he would have given you the definition of work as force times distance, but in the more complete form, something like f dot ds, if you remember. Uh, and this, this was the net force. Uh, yeah. But we can also do the work of single forces uh, and then add them up just like we add up the forces themselves for the net force. And then, again, moving from one spot, the, the boundary, in this case, moving from one spot to the other. Remember what the dot product does for us? The dot product was crucial to this. Dana, you remember. I can tell by the look on your face you remember. No, you don't remember. Man. This should sue your physics one teacher. The angle? Yeah, it had to do with the angle. The fact that the component of the force in the direction of the movement is the only component that does any work. Uh, we originally set it up by having some kind of object with some force acting on it. And it's only the component in the direction of motion that did any work. The other component did no work. Doesn't mean it didn't have something to do with the problem, because that component of the force would increase the friction, and that would increase the work done by the friction, so it can't affect the end result. But it's only the component of the work in the direction of motion that was doing any of the work. So we could put more something like that uh, after the dot product. And that's exactly what we did in class. Okay, so let's apply it now to more of our thermodynamic systems. We'll take a cylinder here, put in a piston which immediately does two things. One, it closes the system. This is a closed system analysis. So we're assuming that this is a closed system. No leakage past that cylinder. No uh, uh, exhaust or inlet valves like there would be in your car engine. Uh, we'll model that a little bit later. But we're not doing so now. And then, of course, a, a yellow polka dot gas of some kind in the cylinder. And what we want to look at is the pressure and the volume. So right below it, we'll graph the volume. Actually, we'll keep it to total volume since that's what's in the, in the picture right there for now. But we just divide by the mass in the system. We get specific volume anyway. And so the volume will go from some initial volume down to, well, wherever we're going to push the cylinder in to some other point, some V2. And as it does so, we'll see what the pressure does with that. 
there's other things going on, you, you know, from the ideal gas law and other relations, the temperature's in there too, but right now we're just looking at pressure and volume. So we're going to start at very big volume, very low pressure, at least relatively low. So we'll be starting somewhere, somewhere like that. And then by application of some driving force of some kind, we'll push that cylinder in and see the volume go up. And at any intermediate point, we can do one of our uh, elemental analyses so that we can set up the integral and do the integral. Okay, so <clears throat> as the force acts through some elemental distance dl, that will do a little bit of work for us. Now, remember this is what we call a quasi-equilibrium process. All of our processes are quasi-equilibrium, which means that as we push this in and the pressure changes, we're assuming the pressure is the same throughout the cylinder. Now, that wouldn't at all be the case if the piston was going in very quickly. There'd be a shock wave built up in front of, or a pressure wave built up in front of the piston, and the pressure would be much higher at the piston than it would be throughout, just because there wouldn't have been enough time yet for that pressure change of the incoming piston to be felt by the rest. But we're assuming that we're doing it slow enough such that the pressure felt in the system is the same everywhere. So we can imagine as a, as a slow uh, step through it. Um, once we are assuming the pressure is the same everywhere and certainly assuming that whatever pressure is in the system is at the piston face of area A, then the force must be overcoming that, that piston. Oh, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, A is fine. Piston area. That's the area of the face of the piston. And then times the, times the DL. Um, that force must be at least as big as the pressure area product on the other side. Now, no minus sign in there because I'm not saying uh, that these are equal and opposite. I'm just replacing this for, with what it needs to be to uh, overcome the pressure. Uh, remember the deal with this little script D instead of the regular differential D? Del. Yeah, that's, that's what we call it, del W. Remember why I made the distinction of the difference between those two? Well, you'll see it, you'll see it, uh, I guess you'll see it if we go ahead and do the do the, finish the integral now. Um, so hang on a step or two and we'll get back to just why we do that. Uh, a DL, the piston area, times any particular elemental displacement of the piston, that's going to be how much volume the piston pushes out in, in that uh, little bit of movement, DL. So then we can call this PDV. So the work done is the pressure of the system times the uh, change in the volume. Because of that, this is often called PDV work. this moving system boundary work that we're doing here. And as we push the piston in, the pressure is going to rise and maybe it'll do something 
like that. We'll talk about just what it'll do in a little bit, but it might do something like that. Then the total work done <coughs> moving our system from state one to state two is this whole integral from L1 to L2 or from V1 to V2. Now, that's, that's really important. That simple little idea there is really important. Because if we know this functional relationship between pressure and volume, we can easily do that integral. Well, we don't even have to know the functional relationship. We could do it with uh, empirical data. Then the integral under that curve is the work done moving the piston from point one to point two. And this argument holds just as well if we turned everything around, had the piston in the cylinder, turned the force around and used that to pull the piston out, or let the system expand and supply that force, which is what your car engine piston does when the gas explodes, the pressure goes way up, it pushes the piston out, the piston turns the crankshaft, crankshaft turns the wheels, and you go down the street in your hot red car, waving to the babes. Except the ones in Jeep Laredos, because they're independent and <laughs> you, can't, you can't get to through to them no matter what. Yeah? Well, if building the pressure is, is work, then what kind of energy should you call it? Is that potential energy, the pressure that's built up? Is it, is it, uh, uh, it's not yeah, I, I guess so, because if you release that force, it's going to spring back, depending well, upon what the atmospheric pressure is. Uh, but that's not the point of it. We're not... I was just curious. Yeah, we're... Well, it, no, no, actually, it is kind of it. We'll, we'll get to that in a second, though, where, where that shows up, because, yeah, that is, that is indeed part of it. Uh, notice two things here that are absolutely crucial and they go together. We are pushing on the system. This is work being done on the system and the integral as shown because of that gives us a negative area. So our sign convention with that that matches this perfectly is work done on a system is negative. And that's exactly what the mathematics shows. Uh, integrating from right to left above the axis is negative area. You have to remember that from your Calc 1. That was the deal uh, with that. But that's going to be real, real important to us. We need to know what areas are negative and what areas are positive. Um, <coughs> Partly it's an outgrowth of the, uh, of the setup as we have it here, but it's also, it also comes from the very nature of where this business was determined. Uh, a lot of thermodynamics was first established when steam engines were coming to, uh, uh, coming to the technological uh, horizon. And work being done by the steam engines was considered positive because that's why you run a steam engine is to get it to produce work and that's the other side of this uh, work done by a system is positive so that's our sign convention with uh, with with the work as we're doing it here uh, sometimes we'll take care of that just like we take care of uh, forces with the direction of the arrow and it'll, it'll uh, come out to be okay. 
if we uh, look at the same type of thing going on with a system that is doing work rather than having work done on it, then we're going the other way and we have positive area and this is work then be done, being done by the system and the integral represents exactly that anyway, positive area for that, negative area for that, um, if it would help. This is going from here to out here with our system pushing on the force, uh, producing the force, or we could even be pulling on that as a way to, uh, to expand the system as well, and that's still consider work being done by the system. Or wouldn't you just put that on the other side of the y-axis over here? I don't have y The negative yeah. side? So one would start at the y-axis, two would be over there, that would make it negative. Yeah, but then it doesn't look as much like the volume one is bigger than the volume two, which is exactly what the system's doing this way. Doing it this way, we can line these right up. Oh, I, see. I can't, I can't flip that over here. Right. Plus, that wouldn't be negative area anyway, would it? Because if, if we have an interval negative over here power, that we're doing that, that's still positive area. Okay, uh, another way this becomes very important to us is those situations like in a car engine where we have not just a single movement of the piston, but cyclical movement of the piston. Where the piston starts uh, at very small volume, which is where it is when the gas is ignited in the system that blows up the gas, it forces the piston out. So we might start here, go down to here somewhere, and then the piston is returned back into the cylinder, recompressing new air and new gasoline, and then the, uh, it starts over again. But that is at a lower point. We'll do this in much more detail when we get to it. When we have a piston moving in a cyclical fashion like this, being forced out as the gas expands, being pushed back in, uh, that's why we don't have one cylinder engines because we need half the engine pushing the cylinders back in as the first half of the engine pushing the cylinders out, <laughs> loosely speaking. But this gives us a net area, the uh, pink is work being done by the system, uh, which would just be our positive. So. Uh, we'll just put W by. And then the return stroke is work being done on the system. And since those two are not equal, we have a positive net area. The net work which is this, the difference between the two here. And in this case, it's, in this illustration, it's positive, which means we have a cyclic, cyclically operating engine producing net, positive net work because we have positive area with every cycle. Then if you're a reasonable human being, you got four of those cylinders doing this. If you're other people, you have eight of them, or 10 or 12, and going at three, four, red line, 7,000 RPM. Each one of those little cylinders putting out a little bit of positive <laughs> work uh, leads to a lot of total work available in the car engine. And we'll talk about these cycles and 
in much more detail in a little bit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more then about this relationship between P and V, this relationship here, because if we know that, then we can actually do these integrals. So I have what's called a polytropic process. No, it doesn't mean you go to two Caribbean islands on a Christmas trip. You, it means that there's a polytropic process. That's what it means. Polytropic process is any process where the volume raised to some power equals a constant, which is determined by state points in the system, uh, usually either 0.1 or 0.2, divided by the pressure of the system. Or if we uh, put it in a, a slightly different way, PV to the nth power is a constant. Now, that sounds like it's just kind of made up out of the blue, but it isn't, because we can look at it in certain ways. For example, uh, if, uh, if V, or if N equals 1, then that P times V, and remember this is V to the 1th, not the product PV to the 1th, it's just V to the 1th. Uh, this looks suspiciously like our ideal gas law, if N equals 1. And if we have a polytropic crop process where PV, this time N equals 1, is a constant, then I'm saying this is a constant for a polytropic process with n equals 1. Well, if MRT is a constant, what else is a constant? What's M? Mass of? Mass of the gas in the system, is that constant? Sure. Yeah, it's a closed system. Is R constant? No. Most constants are constant. That's the gas constant. Which means then that temperature in this case is a constant as well. So if we draw that on a PV diagram, it looks roughly, uh, well, listen, between two volumes, it looks roughly like, uh, like this, we'll change the color. That's an isothermal system, isothermal polytropic process with N equals 1. Those things are all the same. If it's a polytropic process with n equals 1, it's isothermal, and, and vice versa. Remember, uh, we're dealing with gases. This is not, uh, this is not apply under the dome. This is well right of the dome. We can also look at another situation, n equals 0. Let's see, p, v to the 0 equals a constant. What's V to the zero? Calculate it. It's, yeah, it's one. So this is the same as saying P equals constant. So if N equals zero, we have a constant pro uh, pressure process, an isobaric process, and that looks like that. And so these polytropic processes are not just uh, things they're making up, it's exactly what works out. And then 
uh, it's hard to show mathematically. But if we have an ISO, remember our ISO for constant volume process? ISO hui? Yes. Isochore, or even isometric, they both mean the same. So this is a, a constant volume process. And this is N equals, anybody happen to know? N equals infinity. So uh, how much work is done in that kind of process? Zero. There is no moving boundary. When the volume doesn't change, we have a rigid tank. No work is done in a system like that. So all of this business matches. And N can be anything in between, depending upon what's going on with the process or the system. Huh? What? Can N be negative infinity? No, because that wouldn't be in between here. Your dry ball. I'll just make sure. All right, so let's uh, let's look at some of these. Maybe starting from the top. N equals one. Uh, P equals constant, those are one and the same, then the work done during that type of process is just simply that pressure times the change in volume. And that's just simply the area under the square top by n equals zero line. Um, and just what the interval comes out to be. Oh, wait, sorry, not n equals 1, sorry, n equals 0. For other n's, yet not equal to 1, and you'll, you'll see why in a second, uh, if you do this integral, if you just do work through this integral, just like you would have in Calc class where the power increases by one and goes underneath and that kind of business as you integrate, you get an integral of uh, V to the N over whatever that constant is. Dv from 1 to 2. And if you work out that integral, it's uh, real easy to do. You get P2 V2 minus P1 V1 over 1 minus N. And so you can see there why we don't want N equal to 1, because then this is undefined. So uh, it's easy enough for you to do that and come up with the other solution if n equals 1. Then you're just doing the integral of v dv over some constant. And that integrates to PV times the log of V2 over V1. And this PV here is the constant that we get when n equals 1. Because if n equals 1, we just have PV equals a constant. That is the constant. And so you can use P1, V1, or P2, V2, either one, because they're going to equal the same thing. In fact, you can at times use one to find the uh, missing part of the other. <laughs> And of 
course, because of that. We can also base that on the pressure ratios. Uh, the indices have to go the other way, of course, because V1 over V2 equals P2 over P1 and vice versa. Okay, the only other little thing I can put in here is a slight addition to that n equals 1 business that we got there. So, we'll put and if n equals 1, then we have an ideal gas process um, and so the integral can then become um, uh, that PV can then also be MRT times the log of the ratio of the volumes or the pressures as we as either one we wish. Um, we can also have an ideal gas, let's see, uh, n equals 1 ideal gas, and not equal to 1 for an ideal gas. What that means is that the temperature is not constant, but we still have an ideal gas, <laughs> then this integral works out to be and you can do this. I know some of you love to integrate. So you can go home, go out to your car, turn it on, think of the engine running. And we get that relationship for, for I think that's all of the combinations we can come up with. Oh no, we can come up with one more. for any ideal gas polytropic process. Then we have one last little piece we can say, really doesn't have to do with the work, but it does have to do with us being able to find whatever missing values we're, we're looking for in any one of these problems. And you can derive all these from the uh, polytropic definition and from the ideal gas law. N minus 1 over N, yep. And then also, as per the volume ratio, V1 over V2, N to the minus 1. That's not going to give you the work directly, but if you've got three of the uh, properties, you can find the fourth. That's 
uh, if this is process A, B, and C, then the work done between states 1 and 2 for process A is greater than that for process B is greater than that for process C and so on. So we very, very much need to, to keep an idea of this area under the uh, integrals being the work done. And if we have a cycle, then the area under is the uh, network done. Okay. Let's see what we want to do. Yeah. Okay, simple little problem here we'll set up. Closed piston cylinder system. And we'll do this. We'll, we've got a, uh, some weights stacked on here right now. So it's, uh, it, that just means it's at greater than atmospheric pressure. We're just adding a little weight to the piston to push down more than, than atmospheric pressure would. some gas in there, and then we'll uh, heat it a little bit. He wants 200 megapascals. V1 0.04 cubic meters. And V2, we're going to heat it until it expands to 0.1 cubic meters. That will cause our, or obviously our system expands because the volume got greater. That will lift the weights. How much work was done during that process? Isotropic, isobaric, isochoric process. Well, it's not isochoric, the volume's changing. So it couldn't be that. Pressure staying the same, right? So we know it's going from 0.04 up to 0.1. Zero. So what? That equals zero because the pressure is constant. Yeah, and these systems, in these pressure of piston cylinder systems, unless you're told otherwise, and not always do they maintain constant pressure, but in this one there's no other information to the contrary. And so the uh, work is the area under the graph. Which is just P delta V. So do it real quick just to make sure you get your units right. Make sure that the minus sign agrees with what you see happening in the problem. Otherwise you have things backwards. What? You got mega on top. Oh, mega? Let me just double check which it was. I'm oh, sorry, it was originally supposed to be kilopascals. I'm just thinking more power. That's all I'm thinking. And how fast we do this would determine how much power is done. This is how much work's being done. Remember, the power is the rate at which work is done. Really nothing more than just making sure
sure you got your units right. What'd you get? 80? Twelve kilonewtons? No. Nope. Don't guess. This is kilonewtons per square meter times cubic meters, so it all together is kilonewton meters, which is a kilojoule. So it is twelve kilojoules. Right, Steve? Right there. There's your calculator. Okay, now, do the same process. I mean, this, the same, same general idea. We, we start at the very same state point, P1 and V1, end up at the same final volume, V2, so same P1, V1, and V2, but as we do so, if we remove the weights and do it just right, and it's easier said than done, but if we remove the weights as this is happening, the pressure will drop, but we can do it that makes the temperature stay constant. Remove weights such that it's a constant temperature process. Now how much work is done by the system? Going between the same volumes, starting from the same point, how much work is done now? Before you calculate it, just think, is it going to be more? Is it going to be less? Is it going to be the same? you do it, is the work going to be less for this process than it was for the other one? And does the, don't shout stuff out. Man. Some people are sitting here in unbridled joy and they're still controlling their behavior. Not you. done by that one, just simply the area under the graph. So here's what we did first. We're starting from the same point, ending at the same volume. We've said now we're going to allow pressure to change. Now we're going to allow pressure to change. That's what happens when we take the weight off. Such that the temperature is constant because uh, uh, as we, as we uh, reduce the pressure, it allows the, uh, uh, the, the extra heat, I guess, goes to raising what weight is there and not increasing the temperature. What's, the, what's a constant temperature process look like on a PV diagram? Yeah. 
it's uh, an n equals one constant temperature process. So obviously the work is going to be less, and we can find out from the uh, uh, relations I gave you there. Obviously the volume has to be in the same units for you to take the log of that ratio. And P1 and V1 we have, and we've already even checked the units, so what do you get? Seven point three three, something like that. Makes sense too, because you actually lifted less weight. In the first problem, you lifted all of this weight up to the second volume. In the second problem, you didn't lift as much weight up because we were taking weight as we went off. So even that makes sense in terms of the amount of work done by the system. Okay, same deal, just real quick. Same general idea. But now approximating the system, uh, taking weight off such that you follow the line n equals 1.3. Which is certainly doable. You can go along and peel off enough weight at each point so we get to, get to follow along a particular line. Is it going to have more work or less work? than either of the other two. Can you predict before we do it? Even less work? N was equal to what on this line? Zero. This is N equals zero. This is N equals one, so continuing down to N equals infinity for that line, we must be in here somewhere. Exactly where, well, we have to do the plot. Um, it, it's a matter of doing the experiment and then fitting the curve, doing the best fit to the data. So this is going to be even a little bit less work than before. Uh, a 
all that stuff's available. You can fill it in. And we get even less work done. 6.4 instead of the 7.3 or even the 12 originally. So we're down to half the power, half the, half the work. Pretty simple. Um, be careful. Polytropic processes do not apply to fluid, for, to liquid vapor systems. It applies to gas systems only. That's the only thing we derive this on. Um, sometimes the, uh, the gas can be considered ideal gas, it makes things even a little bit simpler. Okay, good enough to clean up. Okay, so uh, another step farther in our closed systems uh, energy analysis. For a closed system, obviously, I hope, whether it's moving boundary or not, for a closed system, the difference between the energy going in and the energy going out is going to give us the total change of the system energy. Oh, before I forget, one, one little thing. Uh, for any polytropic process, It doesn't have to be on the total volume. It can be on the specific volume as well. Is the constant the same? Football. Just tired of guessing. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> well, luckily, it's not like who wants to be a millionaire, or if you're wrong, you're out of here. But if you're wrong once more, you're out of here. <laughs> Same constant? No, because uh, don't forget that if we divide the volume by the mass, we get the specific volume. So we have to do that to both sides. <laughs> so it's not the same constant. This will be a, a constant prime. I don't know, like something, something just to make it look different. Now this system energy is made up of the mass of the system itself having some internal energy that may change, some potential energy and kinetic energy that may change. So Alan, there's kind of an answer to your question earlier. So yes, this will affect the system energies and uh, the, just the potential energy in the gas itself would be reflected here, where this is more the altitude of the gas changing or the speed of the gas changing, if the, if the whole system is traveling somewhere. So, uh, we've looked at that business before. We need to look a little bit more at this E in and out stuff. It can come from heat transfer. And our system, our symbol for that is Q. Big Q if it's the total heat transfer, little Q if it's the specific heat transfer, the transfer heat transfer per unit mass. Of course, we can also do work on the system, and that's uh, W, and that also can have a specific work value to it. 
work per unit mass uh, if we divided through by the mass. Well, we didn't have the mass on the last problem, but we could have divided through by the mass of it. It would have been kilojoules per kilogram uh, of work being done. <coughs> And uh, we could have energy being carried in or out by mass transfer, except for closed systems. This equals zero by definition of a closed system. But we won't always have closed systems. We'll look at open systems. Yeah, in a bit. You mean okay. net to that, right? Huh? You mean net, right? If you have the same mass coming in as you have coming out, that's still a full system. No, well, that's that's kind of what's next. Because uh, this is just saying, how can energy get in or out of the system? It can either, heat can transfer in or out, work can be done by or on the system, uh, but we can't have mass transfer. So our net heat transfer is the difference between what's coming in and what's going out. And if more is coming in than is going out, that's positive. If more is coming out than going in, that's negative. Uh, so this is positive if it's net heat transfer into the system. And that again comes from the idea that when we're running these systems to do some work, we have to pay for the heat. We have to pay for the coal or the oil or the, uh, um, the uranium, whatever it is that's supplying the heat, we have to pay for. Work net is the other way around because of our heat, our, our convention. But written this way, this is also positive if it's work by the system rather than on the system. Because work out is considered work being done by the system. Work in is us doing work on the system. And the difference between those two is the network. We put those together with this, and we get the net heat transfer minus the network done is equal to the change in energy of the system. And that gets a red box. And I don't think I've done a red box this year in this class. So that's important. Huh, you wish you'd paid attention now, huh? Where did a red box come from? I wish I had a red Dang. pencil. Dang. Want the chalk? Or a red pen. You make a box around this one. You can't, you can't even carry a red pen. You don't have a New York State permit to carry a red pen. No, there's I no know We don't one. leave them out. I know you have one. <laughs> yeah, I have one. You bet. <laughs> This is the first law of thermodynamics. Governs the universe, as well as others. Um, it's, it's, we haven't actually proved... What? We haven't actually proved that this works, we just said it does, and there's been no evidence to the contrary ever found, so, uh, well, that's good enough. 
Because uh, if we were going to question things that were told, this wouldn't be as much like a religion as it is for us. You believe whatever I tell you. <laughs> All right, so let's let's work this some some problem. Oh, we'll have just enough time to do this one. Okay, we have a rigid tank of five cubic meters. Of which point oh five cubic meters is liquid, saturated liquid. Remember our systems are always in equilibrium, which means we assume the saturated the vapor phase is at its saturated state, the liquid phase is at its saturated state. Uh, all that really means is that any interchange between the surface between the two, which is constantly going on, is uh, is a net a net zero. So we have vapor up there, which of course is pink, and liquid down there, which of course is blue, because it's water. And the water vapor was red. Yes, it is because it's hot. Go, go stick your face Red over your water. teapot. You never knew it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, get your teapot whistling and put your ear right down there to listen to it. They're whistling. <laughs> Tell me how that goes. Tell me you don't think it's red. Oh, no, I don't. You're absolutely right. That's not all that will be red. Because I learned in chemistry years ago from Vickery's animations that oxygen atoms are red. And that's why water vapor is red, because it's got oxygen. Must be. Must be, and those are red. those are big red atoms. Balls, red yeah, balls, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah red, big red balls. Uh, oh, the the system pressure is point uh, one megapascals. Okay, so that's what we got, and then the system is heated such that it vaporizes the remaining liquid. How much heat does that require? There be the question. Start with our first law for closed systems. And obviously what we're looking for is what's this Q net term. Uh, there may be heat coming out. Whatever comes out we've got to put in even more because we need to get to the state of liquid vaporization. Um, so that's what we're looking for. How much net work's being done, or how can we find it? Because we're going to need all the other pieces to find that. I guess I could write that down. Find Q net. All right, so we're looking for this. How much work's being done? Remember, this is on or by the system. Paul, you don't want to guess? You want to just shout something out without thinking about it? Nope. <laughs> How much? No work. No work. We have no change in boundary. We have no work being done. Uh, we could have a, a paddle running in the system to help stir it. That would be work being done on the system. Uh, we might... Um, I guess technically if we had a resistance heater rather than a, than a, a Bunsen burner, that would be work being added to the system. And then this business we also need to 
find. And of course, any of those zero? Yeah, our system's not going anywhere, we assume. And if it is, we weren't told anything about that. So uh, we can find the network if one, we can find the total mass of fluid in the system. And two, if we can uh, find the change in potential uh, in the internal energy. What's the system look like on a PV diagram? We start where? Under the curve. We know that because we have both phases in equilibrium. So we start somewhere under the curve. Uh, just where under the to peak, we have no idea. It's just an idea of what we're doing. And then end up where? Heated to vaporize, if we're not told anything more, which we need more, vaporize and then superheat, we have to assume it's just enough to vaporize it, just to the point where all of the liquid is vaporized, we have nothing but saturated vapor, which puts us right on the dome. And since it's a constant volume process, we know that the process line is vertical. And that goes with our notion of no work being done, because there's no area under that process. Okay, so we need, to, we need to find a couple things. We need to find the mass, and then we need to find U2 and U1, each of those uh, individual. When we find all that business, then we can uh, put it together and we get Q net. So, uh, how do we find the mass? of the system. Yeah, well the, the mass of the system is made up with how much fluid we have and how much vapor we have. We know how much volume we've got, but we don't know how much mass we've got. How do we figure out how much mass we've got? Uh, the quality is defined on the mass. Look in the table for the pressure and find the specifics. Divide. Right. Find the specific what? Volumes. Um, F and B G. Yeah, we can, we can take the specific volume of either. If we can find the specific volume of the liquid phase, we already know the total volume of the liquid phase, we can find the mass of the liquid phase. And same thing for the gas, then we can use that to find the quality. Then we can use the quality to find the specific energy, uh, internal energy. Oops, M. Not B. Algebra gets really easy if that was a B there. There's a thing I looked for that too, by the way. Internal energy. Just say int energy. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Uh, if we have time, we'll we'll do that for the easy. We don't have time. Uh, so we can find those two masses and that'll give us the total mass. So let's uh, again practice going through the tables. Since in an absolute fit of generosity, I didn't make you do much on the tables on the test. So you all... Ah, I don't have my tables here. Who's it? Malcolm does. All right. We have... We're under the dome, so we know we're in the saturated tables. We have the pressure, so we know we're in the saturated pressure table. So if you could share that with me. Saturated pressure, that's refrigerant, in water. So that's table uh, five, 
One more. There we go. Saturated water, that's the temperature table. Saturated water pressure table. So it's table A5. Man, some excellent students are very... Oh, man. I don't know who works in here. I'm going to kill that person. Oh, was that on tape? All right, here we go. Okay, so we're at a pressure of 0.1 megapascals. Uh, that puts us right here again. We're on the saturated water because we have both faces together. We know we're under the dome. We're given the pressure, so we go to the pressure table. And we go down to 100 kilopascals. And there we've got VF there and VG there. And so we can use both of those to find the mass. Since we're running out of time, I'll give that to you. You can double check them. Mass of the liquid is... 47.9 kilograms and the mass of the gas 2.92 kilograms. Okay, that's using VF and VG right from the table. We're assuming both phases are in their saturated state. That does indeed put them at opposite ends of the Dome. But uh, the mixture together is what gives us the state point in between. Alright, from that uh, you can find then the quality. Do I happen to have that written down? I don't actually have that written down. Uh, well, actually, we don't need it because. We need U1. Actually, what we need is uh, what we need is capital U1, which is M little U1. And we can find that by using the tables and using the quality, but we can short circuit this a little bit by doing it the mass of the fluid times the fluid internal energy plus the mass of the gas times the fluid times the gas internal energy, which saves us the trouble of finding the quality. Either one will work, whichever one you're more comfortable with. It's just there's a uh, a little more calculation here because you have to find the quality and if you mix that up you're screwed up and you already have these numbers and those you can just look up right out of the chart they're just on oh, there already on there it's uh it's uf is that one ug is this one remember what this middle column is ufg the difference between those two it's just a convenience they've done for you in the charts already So both of those numbers are, are what we call look upable. And then you multiply them by the angle of the mass. Don't, don't get the masses screwed up. Be real careful with your subscripts. It's uh, easy to do when you're going along at high speed. Either way, uh, a little bit of difference in round off, but you should get something like 27,300 kilojoules. A lot of lot of energy being added uh, in that system, just in the liquid vapor phase. It's twenty seven thousand kilojoules or twenty seven kilojoules. It's twenty seven thousand kilojoules. Uh, you double check it. You don't have anything else to do. The the uh, thing is, we have a, a lot of uh, fluid, and even that has a, a pretty good pressure. So you can you can multiply those together. So that's not that. Look at my paper. Right here it says. Oh, yeah, it's 27,000 kilojoules. That's what I said. This is right? Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs>
and for U2, we can use the total mass times the U sub G at that same volume, which we've got to find. So, uh, yeah, we don't have, oh no, we don't, we don't, we're okay. Oh no, we do need that. At V1 equals V2 equals the total volume over the total mass. So we can find that, then go in the table and see where that hits, which is pretty easy. We don't have to find any quality. Well, there is no quality here. Oh, well, the quality is one. Um, that volume comes out to be 0 0.098. kilogram and we don't know what pressure that occurs at so we have to go down tell VG equals something like that so 0 0.098 we're way off the bottom there oh man VG Point oh, here we go, right about, right about here. Right about there. We're a little bit between those, so we're a little bit over 2,000 kilopascals. And we can estimate is good enough. Uh, 0.098, there's about 10 in between there. We're about one under that, so about one-tenth of that. Ah, that's way too much detail for us. P2 is about maybe 2050 or so. That's close enough. That's close enough. And remember, we're here to get UG. And so, look at, there's no difference between those. So we don't even need to estimate. We'll just make it the 2600. U2 is 2600 kilojoules per kilogram. So we found the, the uh, specific volume because we know the total volume of the system, total mass of the system. Use that to find what line we're on. Use that to find out what UG is because that's the UG we needed right here. Ha! It's time to go. So you double check, finish up. Total heat added, 105 megajoules. And now we have all those pieces. Okay, so double check that. Unless you have something to celebrate, and so you're not going to do any homework tonight because you're celebrating. <laughs> I hope I would. <laughs> what? Here, Malcolm. Thank you very much. Oh, this one is my favorite student. <laughs>